Chapter One, Part One of The Water Babies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corey Samuel. The Water Babies by Charles Kingsley. Chapter One, Part One. I heard a thousand blended notes. While in a grove I sat reclined, in that sweet mood when pleasant thoughts bring sad thoughts to the mind. To her fair works did nature link the human soul that through me ran, and much it grieved my heart to think what man has made of man. Wordsworth. Once upon a time there was a little chimney sweep, and his name was Tom. That is a short name, and you have heard it before, so you will not have much trouble in remembering it. He lived in a great town in the north country, where there were plenty of chimneys to sweep and plenty of money for Tom to earn and his master to spend. He could not read nor write, and did not care to do either, and he never washed himself, for there was no water up the court where he lived. He had never been taught to say his prayers. He had never heard of God or of Christ. Except in words which you have never heard, and which it would have been as well if he had never heard, he cried half his time and laughed the other half. He cried when he had to climb the dark flues, rubbing his poor knees and elbows raw, and when the soot got into his eyes, which it did every day in the week, and when his master beat him, which he did every day in the week, and when he had not enough to eat, which happened every day in the week likewise. And he laughed the other half of the day, when he was tossing halfpennies with the other boys, or playing leapfrog over the posts, or bowling stones at the horses' legs as they trotted by, which last was excellent fun, when there was a wall at hand behind which to hide. As for chimney sweeping, and being hungry and being beaten, he took all that for the way of the world, like the rain and snow and thunder, and stood manfully with his back to it till it was over. As his old donkey did to a hailstorm, and then shook his ears and was as jolly as ever, and thought of the fine times coming when he would be a man and a master sweep, and sit in the public house with a quart of beer and a long pipe, and play cards for silver money, and wear velveteens and ankle jacks, and keep a white bulldog with one grey ear, and carry her puppies in his pocket just like a man. And he would have apprentices, one, two, three, if he could. How he would bully them and knock them about, just as his master did to him, and make them carry home the soot sacks, while he rode before them on his donkey, with a pipe in his mouth and a flower in his buttonhole, like a king at the head of his army. Yes, there were good times coming, and when his master let him have a pull at the leavings of his beer. Tom was the jolliest boy in the whole town. One day, a smart little groom rode into the court where Tom lived. Tom was just hiding behind a wall to heave half a brick at his horse's legs, as is the custom of that country when they welcome strangers. But the groom saw him and hallooed to him to know where Mister Grimes, the chimney sweep, lived. Now, Mister Grimes was Tom's own master. And Tom was a good man of business and always civil to customers, so he put the half brick down quietly behind the wall and proceeded to take orders. Mister Grimes was to come up next morning to Sir John Harthover's at the place, for his old chimney sweep was gone to prison and the chimneys wanted sweeping. And so he rode away, not giving Tom time to ask what the sweep had gone to prison for, which was a matter of interest to Tom, as he had been in prison once or twice himself. Moreover, the groom looked so very neat and clean, with his drab gaiters, drab breeches, drab jacket, snow-white tie with a smart pin in it, and clean round ruddy face, that Tom was offended and disgusted at his appearance, and considered him a stuck-up fellow, who gave himself airs because he wore smart clothes and other people paid for them, and went behind the wall to fetch the half brick after all. But did not remembering that he had come in the way of business and was, as it were, under a flag of truce. His master was so delighted at his new customer 
that he knocked Tom down out of hand, and drank more beer that night than he usually did in two, in order to be sure of getting up in time next morning. For the more a man's head aches when he wakes, the more glad he is to turn out and have a breath of fresh air. And, when he did get up at four the next morning, he knocked Tom down again in order to teach him, as young gentlemen used to be taught at public schools, that he must be an extra good boy that day, as they were going to a very great house, and might make a very good thing of it, if they could but give satisfaction. And Tom thought so likewise, and indeed would have done and behaved his best, even without being knocked down. For, of all places upon earth, Harthover Place, which he had never seen, was the most wonderful, and, of all men on earth, Sir John, whom he had seen, having been sent to jail by him twice, was the most awful. Harthover Place was really a grand place, even for the rich north country, with a house so large that in the frame-breaking riots, which Tom could just remember, the Duke of Wellington and ten thousand soldiers to match were easily housed therein, at least so Tom believed, with a park of deer, which Tom believed to be monsters who were in the habit of eating children, with miles of game preserves, in which Mr. Grimes and the collier lads poached at times, on which occasions Tom saw pheasants, and wondered what they tasted like, with a noble salmon river, in which Mr. Grimes and his friends would have liked to poach, but then they must have got into cold water, and that they did not like at all. In short, Harthover was a grand place, and Sir John a grand old man, whom even Mr. Grimes respected, for not only could he send Mr. Grimes to prison when he deserved it, as he did once or twice a week, not only did he own all the land about for miles, not only was he a jolly, honest, sensible squire, as ever kept a pack of hounds, who would do what he thought right by his neighbours, as well as get what he thought right for himself, but, what was more, he weighed full fifteen stone, was nobody knew how many inches round the chest, and could have thrashed Mr. Grimes himself in fair fight, which very few folk round there could do and which, my dear little boy, would not have been right for him to do, as a great many things are not, which one both can do, and would like very much to do. So Mr. Grimes touched his hat to him when he rode through the town, and called him a burly old chap, and his young ladies, greyly lasses, which are two high compliments in the North Country, and thought that that made up for his poaching Sir John's pheasants whereby you may perceive that Mr. Grimes had not been to a properly inspected Government National School. Now, I dare say, you never got up at three o'clock on a midsummer morning. Some people get up then because they want to catch salmon, and some because they want to climb Alps, and a great many more because they must, like Tom. But I assure you that three o'clock on a midsummer morning is the pleasantest time of all the twenty-four hours, and all the three hundred and sixty-five days. And why every one does not get up then, I never could tell, save that they are all determined to spoil their nerves and their complexions, by doing all night what they might just as well do all day. But Tom, instead of going out to dinner at half-past eight at night, and to a ball at ten, and finishing off somewhere between twelve and four, went to bed at seven, when his master went to the public-house, and slept like a dead pig, for which reason he was as pert as a gamecock, who always gets up early to wake the maids, and just ready to get up when the fine gentlemen and ladies were just ready to go to bed. So he and his master set out, Grimes rode the donkey in front, and Tom and the brushes walked behind, out of the court and up the street, past the closed window shutters and the winking weary policemen, and the roofs all shining grey in the grey dawn. They passed through the pitman's village, all shut up and silent now, and through the turnpike, and then they were out in the real country, and plodding along the black dusty road, between black slag walls, with no sound but the groaning and thumping of the pit-engine in the next field. But soon the road grew white, and the walls likewise, and at the wall's foot grew long grass and gay flowers, all drenched in dew and instead of the groaning of the pit-engine, 
they heard the skylark saying his matins high up in the air, and the pit-bird warbling in the sedges, as he had warbled all night long. All else was silent, for old Mrs. Earth was still fast asleep, and, like many pretty people, she looked still prettier asleep than awake. The great elm-trees in the gold-green meadows were fast asleep above, and the cows fast asleep beneath them. Nay, the few clouds which were about were fast asleep likewise, and so tired that they had lain down on the earth to rest, in long white flakes and bars, among the stems of the elm-trees, and along the tops of the alders by the stream, waiting for the sun to bid them rise and go about their day's business, in the clear blue overhead. On they went, and Tom looked and looked, for he had never been so far into the country before and longed to get over a gate and pick buttercups, and look for birds' nests in the hedge. But Mr. Grimes was a man of business, and would not have heard of that. Soon they came up with a poor Irishwoman, trudging along with a bundle at her back. She had a grey shawl over her head, and a crimson madder petticoat, so you may be sure she came from Galway. She had neither shoes nor stockings, and limped along, as if she were tired and footsore. But she was a very tall, handsome woman, with bright grey eyes, and heavy black hair hanging about her cheeks. And she took Mr. Grimes's fancy so much, that when he came alongside he called out to her, "'This is a hard road for a gravely foot like that. Will ye up, lass, and ride behind me?' But, perhaps, she did not admire Mr. Grimes's look and voice, for she answered quietly, "'No, thank you. I'd sooner walk with your little lad here.' "'You may please yourself,' growled Grimes, and went on smoking. So she walked beside Tom, and talked to him, and asked him where he lived, and what he knew, and all about himself, till Tom thought he had never met such a pleasant-spoken woman. And she asked him at last whether he said his prayers, and seemed sad when he told her that he knew no prayers to say. Then he asked her where she lived and she said, Far away by the sea. And Tom asked her about the sea, and she told him how it rolled and roared over the rocks in winter nights, and lay still in the bright summer days for the children to bathe and play in it, and many a story more, till Tom longed to go and see the sea, and bathe in it likewise. At last, at the bottom of a hill, they came to a spring. Not such a spring as you see here, which soaks up out of a white gravel in the bog, among red fly-catchers, and pink bottle-heath, and sweet white orchis. Nor such a one as you may see too here, which bubbles up under the warm sand-bank, in the hollow lane, by the great tuft of lady-ferns, and makes the sand-dance reels at the bottom day and night all the year round. Not such a spring as either of those, but a real north-country limestone fountain, like one of those in Sicily, or Greece, where the old heathen fancied the nymphs sat cooling themselves the hot summer's day, while the shepherds peeped at them from behind the bushes. Out of a low cave of rock, at the foot of a limestone crag, the great fountain rose, quelling and burbling and gurgling, so clear that you could not tell where the water ended and the air began, and ran away under the road, a stream large enough to turn a mill, among blue geranium, and golden globe-flower, and wild raspberry, and the bird-cherry with its tassels of snow. And there Grimes stopped, and looked, and Tom looked too. Tom was wondering if anything lived in that dark cave, and came out at night to fly in the meadows. But Grimes was not wondering at all. Without a word he got off his donkey, and clambered over the low road wall, and knelt down, and began dipping his ugly head into the spring, and very dirty he made it. Tom was picking the flowers as fast as he could. The Irishwoman helped him, and showed him how to tie them up, and very pretty nosegay they had made between them. But when he saw Grimes actually wash, he stopped, quite astonished, and when Grimes had finished, and began shaking his ears to dry them, he said, "'Why, Master, I never saw you do that before.' nor will again, most likely. 'Twasn't for cleanliness I did it, but for coolness. 
I'd be ashamed to want washing every week or so, like any smutty collier lad. I wish I might go and dip my head in, said poor little Tom. It must be as good as putting it under the town pump, and there is no beadle here to drive a chap away. Thou come along, said Grimes. What dost thou want with washing thyself? Thou did not drink a half gallon of beer last night like me. I don't care for you, said naughty Tom, and ran down to the stream and began washing his face. Grimes was very sulky, because the woman preferred Tom's company to his. So he dashed at him with horrid words, and tore him up from his knees and began beating him. But Tom was accustomed to that, and got his head safe between Mr. Grimes's legs, and kicked his shins with all his might. "'Are you not ashamed of yourself, Thomas Grimes?' cried the Irishwoman over the wall. Grimes looked up, startled at her knowing his name. But all he answered was, "'No, nor never was yet,' and went on beating Tom. "'True for you. If you ever had been ashamed of yourself, you would have gone over into Vendale long ago.' "'What do you know about Vendale?' shouted Grimes. But he left off beating Tom. "'I know about Vendale, and about you too. I know, for instance, what happened in Aldermire Copse by night two years ago come Martin Mass. "'You do?' shouted Grimes, and leaving Tom he climbed up over the wall and faced the woman. Tom thought he was going to strike her, but she looked him too full and fierce in the face for that. "'Yes, I was there,' said the Irishwoman, quietly. "'You are no Irishwoman by your speech,' said Grimes, after many bad words. "'Never mind who I am. I saw what I saw, and if you strike that boy again I can tell what I know.' Grimes seemed quite cowed, and got on his donkey without another word. "'Stop,' said the Irishwoman. "'I have one more word for you both, for you will both see me again before all is over. Those that wish to be clean, clean they will be, and those that wish to be foul, foul they will be. Remember!' and she turned away and threw a gate into the meadow. Grimes stood still a moment, like a man who has been stunned. Then he rushed after her, shouting, "'You come back!' But when he got into the meadow, the woman was not there. Had she hidden away? There was no place to hide in. But Grimes looked about, and Tom also, for he was as puzzled as Grimes himself at her disappearing so suddenly. But look where they would, she was not there. Grimes came back again, as silent as a post, for he was a little frightened, and, getting on his donkey, filled a fresh pipe and smoked away, leaving Tom in peace. And now they had gone three miles and more, and came to Sir John's lodge-gates. Very grand lodges they were, with very grand iron gates, and stone gate-posts, and on the top of each a most dreadful bogey, all teeth, horns, and tail, which was the crest which Sir John's ancestors wore in the Wars of the Roses. And very prudent men they were to wear it, for all their enemies must have run for their lives at the very first sight of them. Grimes rang at the gate, and out came a keeper on the spot, and opened. "'I was told to expect thee,' he said. Now thou'lt be as good as to keep to the main avenue, and not let me find a hare or rabbit on thee when thou comest back. I shall look sharp for one, I tell thee. Not if it's in the bottom of the soot-bag, quoth Grimes, and at that he laughed, and the keeper laughed, and said, If that's thy sort, I may as well walk up with thee to the hall. I think thou best had. It's thy business to see after thy game, man, and not mine. So the keeper went with them and to Tom's surprise, he and Grimes chatted together all the way quite pleasantly. He did not know that a keeper is only a poacher turned outside in, and a poacher a keeper turned inside out. They walked up a great lime avenue, a full mile long, and between their stems Tom peeped trembling at the horns of the sleeping deer, which stood up among the ferns. Tom had never seen such enormous trees, and as he looked up, he fancied that the blue sky rested on their heads. But he was puzzled very much by a strange murmuring noise, 
which followed them all the way. So much puzzled, that at last he took courage to ask the keeper what it was. He spoke very civilly, and called him Sir, for he was horribly afraid of him, which pleased the keeper, and he told him that they were the bees around the lime-flowers. "'What are bees?' asked Tom. "'What make honey?' "'What is honey?' asked Tom. "'Thou hold thy noise,' said Grimes. "'Let the boy be,' said the keeper. "'He's a civil young chap now, and that's more than he'll be long if he bides with thee.' Grimes laughed, for he took that as a compliment. "'I wish I were a keeper,' said Tom, "'to live in such a beautiful place, and wear green velveteens, and have a real dog-whistle at my button, like you.' The keeper laughed. He was a kind-hearted fellow enough. "'Let well alone, lad, and ill too at times. Thy life's safer than mine at all events, eh, Mr. Grimes?' And Grimes laughed again and then the two men began talking quite low. Tom could hear, though, that it was about some poaching fight, and at last Grimes said surlily, "'Hast thou anything against me?' "'Not now.' "'Then don't ask me any questions till thou hast, for I am a man of honour." And at that they both laughed again, and thought it a very good joke. And by this time they were come up to the great iron gates in front of the house, and Tom stared through them at the rhododendrons and azaleas, which were all in flower, and then at the house itself, and wondered how many chimneys there were in it, and how long ago it was built, and what was the man's name that built it, and whether he got much money for his job. These last were very difficult questions to answer. For Harthover had been built at ninety different times, and in nineteen different styles, and looked as if somebody had built a whole street of houses of every imaginable shape, and then stirred them together with a spoon. For the attics were Anglo-Saxon, the third door Norman, the second Sanxento, the first floor Elizabethan, the right wing pure Doric, the centre early English, with a huge portico copied from the Parthenon, the left wing pure Boeotian, which the country folk admired most of all, because it was just like the new barracks in the town, only three times as big. The grand staircase was copied from the catacombs at Rome, the back staircase from the Taj Mahal at Agra. This was built by Sir John's great-great-great-uncle, who won, in Lord Clive's Indian Wars, plenty of money, plenty of wounds, and no more taste than his betters. The cellars were copied from the caves of Elephanta, the offices from the pavilion at Brighton, and the rest from nothing in heaven or earth or under the earth. So that Harthover House was a great puzzle to antiquarians, and a thorough Naboth's vineyard to critics, and architects, and all persons who like meddling with other men's business, and spending other men's money. So they were all setting upon poor Sir John, year after year, and trying to talk him into spending a hundred thousand pounds or so, in building, to please them and not himself. But he always put them off, like a canny north countryman, as he was. One wanted him to build a Gothic house, but he said he was no Goth, and another to build an Elizabethan, but he said he lived under good Queen Victoria, and not good Queen Bess, and another was bold enough to tell him that his house was ugly, but he said he lived inside it and not outside and another that there was no unity in it, but he said that was just why he liked the old place, for he liked to see how each Sir John and Sir Hugh and Sir Ralph and Sir Randall had left his mark upon the place, each after his own taste, and he had no more notion of disturbing his ancestors' work than of disturbing their graves. For now the house looked like a real live house that had a history and had grown and grown as the world grew, and that it was only an upstart fellow, who did not know who his own grandfather was, who would change it for some spick-and-span new Gothic or Elizabethan thing, which looked as if it had been all spawned in a night as mushrooms are. From which you may collect, if you have wit enough, that Sir John was a very sound-headed, sound-hearted squire, and just the man to keep the countryside in order, and show good sport with his hounds. But Tom and his master did not go in through the great iron gates, as if they had been dukes or bishops, but round the back way, 
and a very long way round it was, and into a little back door, where the ash-boy let them in, yawning horribly. And then in a passage the housekeeper met them, in such a flowered chintz dressing-gown, that Tom mistook her for my lady herself. And she gave Grimes solemn orders about, "'You will take care of this, and take care of that,' as if he was going up the chimneys, and not Tom. And Grimes listened, and said every now and again, under his voice, "'You'll mind that, you little beggar.' And Tom did mind, at least all that he could. And then the housekeeper turned them into a grand room, all covered up in sheets of brown paper, and bade them begin, in a lofty and tremendous voice. And so, after a whimper or two, and a kick from his master, into the great Tom went, and up the chimney, while a housemaid stayed in the room to watch the furniture, to whom Mr. Grimes paid many playful and chivalrous compliments, but met with very slight encouragement in return. End of chapter 1, part 1《Chapter One, Part Two of the Water Babies by Charles Kingsley, read for LibriVox.org by Corrie Samuel. How many chimneys Tom swept I cannot say, but he swept so many that he got quite tired and puzzled too, for they were not like the town flues to which he was accustomed, but such as you would find, if you would only get up them and look, which perhaps you would not like to do, in old country houses large and crooked chimneys, which had been altered again and again, until they ran into each other, anastomosing, as Professor Owen would say, considerably. So Tom fairly lost his way in them, not that he cared much for that, though he was in pitchy darkness, for he was as much at home in a chimney as a mole is underground. But at last, coming down as he thought the right chimney, he came down the wrong one, and found himself standing on the hearth-rug, in a room the like of which he had never seen before. Tom had never seen the like. He had never been in gentlefolks' rooms, but when all the carpets were up, and the curtains were down, and the furniture huddled together under a cloth, and the pictures covered with aprons and dusters. And he had often enough wondered what the rooms were like, when they were all ready for the quality to sit in. And now he saw, and he thought the sight very pretty. The room was all dressed in white. White window curtains, white bed curtains, white furniture, and white walls, with just a few lines of pink here and there. The carpet was all over gay little flowers, and the walls were hung with pictures in gilt frames, which amused Tom very much. There were pictures of ladies and gentlemen, and pictures of horses and dogs. The horses he liked, but the dogs he did not care for much, for there were no bulldogs among them, not even a terrier. But the two pictures which took his fancy most were, one a man in long garments, with little children and their mothers round him, who was laying his hand upon the children's heads. That was a very pretty picture, Tom thought, to hang in a lady's room, for he could see it was a lady's room, by the dresses which lay about. The other picture was that of a man nailed to a cross, which surprised Tom much. He fancied that he had seen something like it in a shop window. But why was it there? Poor man, thought Tom, and he looks so kind and quiet. But why should the lady have such a sad picture as that in her room? Perhaps it was some kinsman of hers, who had been murdered by the savages in foreign parts, and she kept it there for a remembrance. And Tom felt sad and awed, and turned to look at something else. The next thing he saw, and that too puzzled him, was a washing-stand, with ewers and basins and soap and brushes and towels, and a large bath full of clean water. What a heap of things all for washing! She must be a very dirty lady, thought Tom, by my master's rule to want as much scrubbing as all that. But she must be very cunning to put the dirt out of the way so well afterwards for I don't see a speck about the room, not even on the very towels. And then, looking toward the bed, he saw that dirty lady, 
and held his breath with astonishment. Under the snow-white coverlet, upon the snow-white pillow, lay the most beautiful little girl that Tom had ever seen. Her cheeks were almost as white as the pillow, and her hair was like threads of gold spread all about over the bed. She might have been as old as Tom, or maybe a year or two older, but Tom did not think of that. He thought only of her delicate skin and golden hair, and wondered whether she was a real live person, or one of the wax dolls he had seen in the shops. But when he saw her breathe he made up his mind that she was alive, and stood staring at her, as if she had been an angel out of heaven. No, she cannot be dirty. She never could have been dirty, thought Tom to himself. And then he thought, and are all people like that when they are washed? And he looked at his own wrist, and tried to rub the soot off, and wondered whether it ever would come off. Certainly I should look prettier then, if I grew at all like her. And looking round, he suddenly saw, standing close to him, a little ugly black ragged figure, with bleared eyes and grinning white teeth. He turned on it angrily. What did such a little black ape want in that sweet young lady's room? And behold, it was himself, reflected in a great mirror, the like of which Tom had never seen before. And Tom, for the first time in his life, found out that he was dirty, and burst into tears with shame and anger, and turned to sneak up the chimney again and hide, and upset the fender and threw the fire-irons down, with a noise as of ten thousand tin-kettles tied to ten thousand mad dogs' tails. Up jumped the little white lady in her bed, and seeing Tom, screamed as shrill as any peacock. In rushed a stout old nurse from the next room, and seeing Tom likewise, made up her mind that he had come to rob, plunder, destroy, and burn, and dashed at him as he lay over the fender, so fast that she caught him by the jacket. But she did not hold him. Tom had been in a policeman's hands many a time, and out of them too, what is more, and he would have been ashamed to face his friends for ever, if he had been stupid enough to be caught by an old woman. So he doubled under the good lady's arm, across the room, and out of the window in a moment. He did not need to drop out, though he would have done so bravely enough, nor even to let himself down a spout, which would have been an old game to him. For once he got up by a spout to the church roof, he said to take Jackdaw's eggs, but the policeman said to steal lead. And when he was seen on high, sat there till the sun got too hot, and came down by another spout, leaving the policeman to go back to the station-house and eat their dinners. But under all the windows spread a tree, with great leaves and sweet white flowers, almost as big as his head. It was magnolia, I suppose, but Tom knew nothing about that, and cared less, for down the tree he went, like a cat, and across the garden lawn, and over the iron railings, and up the park toward the wood, leaving the old nurse to scream murder and fire at the window. The undergardener, mowing, saw Tom, and threw down his scythe, caught his leg in it, and cut his shin open, whereby he kept his bed for a week, but in his hurry he never knew it, and gave chase to poor Tom. The dairymaid heard the noise, got the churn between her knees, and tumbled over it, spilling all the cream, and yet she jumped up and gave chase to Tom. A groom cleaning Sir John's hack at the stables let him go loose, whereby he kicked himself lame in five minutes, but he ran out and gave chase to Tom. Grimes upset the soot-sack in the new gravelled yard, and spoilt it all utterly, but he ran out and gave chase to Tom. The old steward opened the park-gate in such a hurry, that he hung up his pony's chin upon the spikes, and, for out I know, it hangs there still, but he jumped off and gave chase to Tom. The ploughman left his horses at the headland, and one jumped over the fence and pulled the other into the ditch, plough and all, but he ran on and gave chase to Tom. The keeper, who was taking a stoat out of a trap, let the stoat go and caught his own finger, but he jumped up and ran after Tom, and considering what he said and how he looked, I should have been sorry for Tom if he had caught him. Sir John looked out of his study window, for he was an early old gentleman, and up at the nurse, 
and a martin dropped mud in his eye, so that he had at last to send for the doctor, and yet he ran out and gave chase to Tom. The Irishwoman, too, was walking up to the house to beg. She must have got round by some byway, but she threw away her bundle and gave chase to Tom likewise. Only my lady did not give chase, for when she had put her head out of the window her nightwig fell into the garden, and she had to ring up her lady's maid and send her down for it privately, which quite put her out of the running, so that she came in nowhere and is consequently not placed. In a word, never was there heard at Hall Place, not even when the fox was killed in a conservatory among acres of broken glass and tons of smashed flower-pots. Such a noise, row, hubbub, babble, shindy, hullabaloo, stramash, charivari, and total contempt of dignity, repose, and order, as that day when Grimes, gardener, the groom, the dairymaid, Sir John, the steward, the ploughman, the keeper, and the Irishwoman, all ran up the park shouting, STOP THIEF! in the belief that Tom had at least a thousand pounds worth of jewels in his empty pockets. And the very magpies and jays followed Tom up, squeaking and screaming, as if he were a hunted fox, beginning to droop his brush. And all the while poor Tom paddled up the park with his little bare feet, like a small black gorilla fleeing to the forest. Alas for him! There was no big father gorilla therein to take his part, to scratch out the gardener's inside with one paw, toss the dairymaid into a tree with another, and wrench off Sir John's head with a third, while he cracked the keeper's skull with his teeth as easily as if it had been a coconut or a paving-stone. However, Tom did not remember ever having had a father, so he did not look for one, and expected to have to take care of himself, while, as for running, he could keep up for a couple of miles with any stage-coach if there was the chance of a copper or a cigar-end, and turn coach-wheels on his hands and feet ten times following, which is more than you can do. Wherefore his pursuers found it very difficult to catch him, and we will hope that they did not catch him at all. Tom, of course, made for the woods. He had never been in a wood in his life, but he was sharp enough to know that he might hide in a bush, or swarm up a tree, and altogether had more chance there than in the open. If he had not known that, he would have been foolisher than a mouse or a minnow. But when he got into the wood, he found it a very different sort of place from what he had fancied. He pushed into a thick cover of rhododendrons, and found himself at once caught in a trap. The boughs laid hold of his legs and arms, poked him in his face and stomach, made him shut his eyes tight, though that was no great loss, for he could not see at best a yard before his nose and when he got through the rhododendrons, the hassock-grass and sedges tumbled him over, and cut his poor little fingers afterwards most spitefully. The birches birched him as soundly as if he had been a nobleman at Eton, and over the face too, which is not fair swishing, as all brave boys will agree. And the lawyers tripped him up and tore his shins, as if they had shark's teeth, which lawyers are likely enough to have. "'I must get out of this,' thought Tom or I shall stay here till somebody comes to help me, which is just what I don't want." But how to get out was the difficult matter. And indeed I don't think he would ever have got out at all, but have stayed there till the cock-robins covered him with leaves, if he had not suddenly run his head against a wall. Now, running your head against a wall is not pleasant, especially if it is a loose wall, with all the stones set on edge and a sharp-cornered one hits you between the eyes, and makes you see all manner of beautiful stars. The stars are very beautiful, certainly, but unfortunately they go in the twenty-thousandth part of a split second, and the pain which comes after them does not. And so Tom hurt his head, but he was a brave boy, and did not mind that a penny. He guessed that over the wall the cover would end, and up it he went, and over like a squirrel and there he was, out on the great grouse moors, which the country folk called Hartover Fell, heather and bog and rock, stretching away and up, up to the very sky. Now Tom was a cunning little fellow, as cunning as an old Exmoor stag. Why not? Though he was but ten years old, he had lived longer than most stags, and had more wits to start with into the bargain. 
he knew as well as a stag that if he backed he might throw the hounds out. So the first thing he did, when he was over the wall, was to make the neatest double sharp to his right, and run along under the wall for nearly half a mile. Whereby Sir John, and the keeper, and the steward, and the gardener, and the ploughman, and the dairymaid, and all the hue and cry together, went on ahead half a mile in the very opposite direction, and inside the wall, leaving him a mile off on the outside, while Tom heard their shouts die away in the woods, and chuckled to himself merrily. At last he came to a dip in the land, and went to the bottom of it, and then he turned bravely away from the wall and up the moor, for he knew that he had put a hill between him and his enemies, and could go on without their seeing him. But the Irishwoman, alone of them all, had seen which way Tom went. She had kept ahead of every one the whole time, and yet she neither walked nor ran. She went along quite smoothly and gracefully, while her feet twinkled past each other so fast that you could not see which one was foremost, till every one asked who the strange woman was, and all agreed, for want of anything better to say, that she must be in league with Tom. But when she came to the plantation they lost sight of her, and they could do no less, for she went quietly over the wall after Tom, and followed him wherever he went. Sir John and the rest saw no more of her, and out of sight was out of mind. And now Tom was right away into the heather, over just such a moor as those in which you have been bred, except that there were rocks and stones lying about everywhere, and that, instead of the moor growing flat as he went upwards, it grew more and more broken and hilly, but not so rough but that little Tom could jog along well enough, and find time, too, to stare about at the strange place, which was like a new world to him. He saw great spiders there, with crowns and crosses marked on their backs, who sat in the middle of their webs, and when they saw Tom coming, shook them so fast that they became invisible. Then he saw lizards, brown and grey and green, and thought they were snakes and would sting him. But they were as much frightened as he, and shot away into the heath. And then, under a rock, he saw a pretty sight, a great brown sharp-nosed creature, with a white tag to her brush, and round her four or five smutty little cubs, the funniest fellows Tom ever saw. She lay on her back, rolling about and stretching out her legs and head and tail in the bright sunshine, and the cubs jumped over her and ran round her and nibbled her paws and lugged her about by the tail, and she seemed to enjoy it mightily. But one selfish little fellow stole away from the rest to a dead crow close by, and dragged it off to hide it, though it was nearly as big as he was. Whereat all his little brothers set off after him in full cry, and saw Tom, and then all ran back, and up jumped Mrs. Vixen, and caught one up in her mouth, and the rest toddled after her, and into a dark crack in the rocks, and there was an end of the show. And next he had a fright for as he scrambled up a sandy brow, whir, puff, puff, cock, cock, kick, something went off in his face with a most horrid noise. He thought the ground had blown up and the end of the world come. And when he opened his eyes, for he shut them very tight, it was only an old cock-grouse who had been washing himself in sand like an Arab for want of water, and who, when Tom had all but trodden on him, jumped up with a noise like the express train leaving his wife and children to shift for themselves, like an old coward, and went off, screaming, Karook! Karook! Murder! Thieves! Fire! Karook! Cock-kick! The end of the world is come! Kick-kick! Cock-kick! He was always fancying that the end of the world was come, when anything happened which was further off than the end of his own nose. But the end of the world was not come, any more than twelfth of August was, though the old grouse-cock was quite certain of it. So the old grouse came back to his wife and family an hour afterwards, and said, "'Cock, cock, kick, my dears, the end of the world is not quite come, but I assure you it is coming the day after to-morrow. Cock!' But his wife had heard that so often that she knew all about it, and a little more. And besides, she was the mother of a family, and had seven little poults to wash and feed every day, and that made her very practical, 
and a little sharp-tempered, so all she answered was, "'Kick, kick, kick! Go and catch spiders! Go and catch spiders! Kick!' So Tom went on and on, he hardly knew why, but he liked the great wide strange place, and the cool fresh bracing air. But he went more and more slowly, as he got higher up the hill, for now the ground grew very bad indeed. Instead of soft turf and springy heather, he met great patches of flat limestone rock, just like ill-made pavements, with deep cracks between the stones and ledges, filled with ferns, so he had to hop from stone to stone, and now and then he slipped in between and hurt his little bare toes, though they were tolerably tough ones, but still he would go on and up, he could not tell why. What would Tom have said if he had seen, walking over the moor behind him, the very same Irishwoman who had taken his part on the road? But whether it was that he looked too little behind him, or whether it was that she kept out of sight behind the rocks and knolls, he never saw her, though she saw him. And now he began to get a little hungry, and very thirsty, for he had run a long way, and the sun had risen high in heaven, and the rock was as hot as an oven, and the air danced reels over it, as it does over a lime-kiln, till everything round seemed quivering and melting in the glare. But he could see nothing to eat, anywhere and still less to drink. The heath was full of bilberries and wimberries, but they were only in flower yet, for it was June. And as for water, who can find that on the top of a limestone rock? Now and then he passed by a deep dark swallow-hole, going down into the earth, as if it was the chimney of some dwarf's house underground. And more than once, as he passed, he could hear water falling, trickling, tinkling, many, many feet below. How he longed to get down to it, and cool his poor baked lips! But, brave little chimney-sweep as he was, he dared not climb down such chimneys as those. So he went on and on, till his head spun round with the heat, and he thought he heard church-bells ringing a long way off. Ah, he thought, where there is a church there will be houses and people, and perhaps someone will give me a bit and a sup so he set off again to look for the church, for he was sure that he heard the bells quite plain. And in a minute more, when he looked around, he stopped again, and said, Why, what a big place the world is! And so it was, for from the top of the mountain he could see, what could he not see? Behind him, far below, was Hearthover, and the dark woods, and the shining salmon river, and on his left, far below, was the town, and the smoking chimneys of the collieries, and far, far away, the river widened to the shining sea, and little white specks, which were ships, lay on its bosom. Before him lay, spread out like a map, great plains and farms and villages, amid dark knots of trees. They all seemed at his very feet, but he had sense to see that they were long miles away. And to his right rose moor after moor, hill after hill, till they faded away, blue into blue sky. But between him and those moors, and really at his very feet, lay something, to which, as soon as Tom saw it, he determined to go, for that was the place for him. A deep, deep green and rocky valley, very narrow and filled with wood, but through the wood, hundreds of feet below him, he could see a clear stream glance. Oh, if he could but get down to that stream! Then, by the stream, he saw the roof of a little cottage, and a little garden, set out in squares and beds. And there was a little red thing moving in the garden, no bigger than a fly. As Tom looked down, he saw that it was a woman in a red petticoat, Ah, perhaps she would give him something to eat. And there were the church bells ringing again. Surely there must be a village down there. Well, nobody would know him, or what had happened at the place. The news could not have got there yet, even if Sir John had set all the policemen in the country after him, and he could get down there in five minutes. Tom was quite right about the hue and cry not having got thither, for he had come without knowing it 
the best part of ten miles from Hearthover. But he was wrong about getting down in five minutes, for the cottage was more than a mile off, and a good thousand feet below. However, down he went, like a brave little man as he was, though he was very footsore, and tired, and hungry, and thirsty, while the church bells rang so loud, he began to think they must be inside his own head, and the river chimed and tinkled far below. And this was the song which it sang. Clear and cool, clear and cool, by laughing shallow and dreaming pool, cool and clear, cool and clear, by shining shingle and foaming weir, under the crag where the oozel sings, and the ivied wall where the church bell rings, undefiled, for the undefiled, play by me, bathe in me, mother and child. Dank and foul, dank and foul, by the smoky town in its murky cowl, foul and dank, foul and dank, by wharf and sewer and slimy bank, Darker and darker the further I go, Baser and baser the richer I grow, Who dares sport with the sin defiled? Shrink from me, turn from me, mother and child. Strong and free, strong and free, The floodgates are open away to the sea, Free and strong, free and strong, Cleansing my streams as I hurry along, to the golden sands, and the leaping bar, And the taintless tide that awaits me afar, As I lose myself in the infinite main, Like a soul that has sinned and is pardoned again, Undefiled, for the undefiled, Play by me, bathe in me, mother and child. So Tom went down, and all the while He never saw the Irishwoman going down behind him. End of chapter 1, part 2. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2, part 1 of The Water Babies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cory Samuel. The Water Babies by Charles Kingsley Chapter 2 Part 1 And is there care in heaven, and is there love in heavenly spirits to these creatures base, that may compassion of their evils move? There is, else much more wretched were the case of men than beasts. But, oh, the exceeding grace of highest God, that loves his creatures so, and all his works with mercy doth embrace, that blessed angels he sends to and fro, To serve to wicked man, to serve his wicked foe. Spencer A mile off, and a thousand feet down. So Tom found it, though it seemed as if he could have chucked a pebble on to the back of the woman in the red petticoat, who was weeding in the garden, or even across the dale to the rocks beyond for the bottom of the valley was just one field broad, and on the other side ran the stream, and above it grey crag, grey down, grey stair, grey moor, walled up to heaven. A quiet, silent, rich, happy place, a narrow crack cut deep into the earth, so deep, and so out of the way, that the bad bogies can hardly find it out. The name of the place is Vendale, and if you want to see it for yourself, you must go up into the High Craven, and search from Bolland Forest north by Ingleborough, to the Nine Standards and Cross Fell, and if you have not found it, you must turn south, and search the Lake Mountains, down to Score Fell and the sea. And then, if you have not found it, you must go northward again, by Merry Carlisle, and search the Cheviots all across, from Annan Water to Berwick Law. And then, whether you have found Vendale or not, you will have found such a country, and such a people, as ought to make you proud of being a British boy. So Tom went to go down, and at first he went down three hundred feet of steep heather, 
mixed up with loose brown grindstone, as rough as a file, which was not pleasant to his poor little heels, as he came bump-stump-jump down the steep, and still he thought he could throw a stone into the garden. Then he went down three hundred feet of limestone terraces, one below the other, as straight as if a carpenter had ruled them with his ruler, and then cut them out with his chisel. There was no heath there, but, first, a little grass slope, covered with the prettiest flowers, rock-rose and saxifrage, and thyme and basil, and all sorts of sweet herbs. Then bump down a two-foot step of limestone, then another bit of grass and flowers, then bump down a one-foot step, then another bit of grass and flowers for fifty yards, as steep as the house-roof, where he had to slide down on his dear little tail. Then another step of stone, ten feet high, and there he had to stop himself, and crawl along the edge to find a crack, for if he had rolled over, he would have rolled right into the old woman's garden, and frightened her out of her wits. Then, when he had found a dark narrow crack, full of green-stalked fern, such as hangs in the basket in the drawing-room, and had crawled down through it, with knees and elbows as he would down a chimney, there was another grass slope, and another step, and so on till— Oh, dear me! I wish it was all over, and so did he! And yet he thought he could throw a stone into the old woman's garden. At last he came to a bank of beautiful shrubs, white beam with its great silver-backed leaves, and mountain ash and oak, and below them cliff and crag, cliff and crag, with great beds of crown ferns and wood sedge, while through the shrubs he could see the stream sparkling, and hear it murmur on the white pebbles. He did not know that it was three hundred feet below. You would have been giddy, perhaps, at looking down, but Tom was not. He was a brave little chimney-sweep, and when he found himself on the top of a high cliff, instead of sitting down and crying for his bubba, though he never had had any bubba to cry for, he said, "'Ah, this will just suit me,' though he was very tired. And down he went, by stock and stone, sedge and ledge, bush and rush, as if he had been born a jolly little black ape, with four hands instead of two. And all the while he never saw the Irishwoman coming down behind him. But he was getting terribly tired now. The burning sun on the fells had sucked him up, but the damp heat of the woody crag sucked him up still more, and the perspiration ran out of the ends of his fingers and toes, and washed him cleaner than he had been for a whole year. But, of course, he dirtied everything terribly as he went. There has been a great black smudge all down the crag ever since, and there have been more black beetles in Vendale since than were ever known before all, of course, owing to Tom's having blacked the original papa of them all, just as he was setting off to be married with a sky-blue coat and scarlet leggings, as smart as a gardener's dog with a polyanthus in his mouth. At last he got to the bottom. But behold, it was not the bottom, as people usually find when they are coming down a mountain, for at the foot of the crag were heaps and heaps of fallen limestone of every size, from that of your head, to that of a stage-wagon, with holes between them full of sweet heath-fern, and before Tom got through them he was out in the bright sunshine again, and then he felt, once for all and suddenly, as people generally do, that he was B-E-A-T, beat. You must expect to be beat a few times in your life, little man, if you live such a life as a man ought to live, let you be as strong and healthy as you may and when you are, you will find it a very ugly feeling. I hope that that day you may have a stout, staunch friend by you who is not beat, for if you have not, you had best lie where you are, and wait for better times, as poor Tom did. He could not get on. The sun was burning, and yet he felt chill all over. He was quite empty, and yet he felt quite sick. There was but two hundred yards of smooth pasture between him and the cottage, and yet he could not walk down it. He could hear the stream murmuring only one field beyond it, and yet it seemed to him as if it were a hundred miles off. 
he lay down on the grass till the beetles ran over him and the flies settled on his nose. I don't know when he would have got up again if the gnats and the midges had not taken compassion on him. But the gnats blew their trumpets so loud in his ear, and the midges nibbled so at his hands and face, wherever they could find a place free from soot, that at last he woke up and stumbled away, down over a low wall and into a narrow road, and up to the cottage door. And a neat, pretty cottage it was, with clipped yew hedges all round the garden, and yews inside too, cut into peacocks and trumpets and teapots, and all sorts of queer shapes. And out of the open door came a noise, like that of the frogs on the great A, when they know it is going to be scorching hot to-morrow. And how they know that, I don't know, and you don't know, and nobody knows. And there, sat by the empty fireplace, which was filled with a pot of sweet herbs, the nicest old woman that ever was seen, in her red petticoat, and short dimity bedgown, and clean white cap, with a black silk handkerchief over it, tied under her chin. At her feet sat the grandfather of all the cats, and opposite her sat, on two benches, twelve or fourteen neat, rosy, chubby little children, learning their criss-cross row, and gabble enough they made about it. Such a pleasant cottage it was! with a shiny clean stone floor, and curious old prints on the walls, and an old black oak sideboard full of bright pewter and brass dishes, and a cuckoo clock in the corner, which began shouting as soon as Tom appeared, not that it was frightened at Tom, but that it was just eleven o'clock. All the children started at Tom's dirty black figure, the girls began to cry, and the boys began to laugh, and all pointed at him rudely enough, but Tom was too tired to care for that. "'What art thou, and what dost thou want?' cried the old dame. "'A chimney-sweep! Away with thee! I'll have no sweeps here!' "'Water!' said poor little Tom, quite faint. "'Water? There's plenty of the beck,' she said, quite sharply. "'But I can't get there. I'm most clemmed with hunger and drought.' And Tom sank down on the doorstep, and laid his head against the post and the old dame looked at him through her spectacles one minute, and two, and three, and then she said, "'He's sick, and a bairn's a bairn, sweep or none.' "'Water,' said Tom. "'God forgive me,' and she put by her spectacles and rose and came to Tom. "'Water's bad for thee. I'll give thee milk.' And she toddled off into the next room, and brought a cup of milk and a bit of bread. Tom drank the milk off at one draught, and then looked up, revived. "'Where didst come from?' said the dame. "'Over fell, there,' said Tom, and pointed up into the sky. "'Over hearth over, and down Luthwaite Crag? Art sure thou art not lying?' "'Why should I?' said Tom, and leant his head against the post. "'And how got ye up there?' "'I came over from the place.' and Tom was so tired and desperate, he had no heart or time to think of a story, so he told all the truth in a few words. "'Bless thy little heart! And thou hast not been stealing, then?' "'No.' "'Bless thy little heart, and I'll warrant not. Why, God's guided the bairn because he was innocent, away from the place, and over hearth over fell, and down Luthwaite Crag. Who ever heard the like, if God hadn't led him?' Why dost not eat thy bread? I can't. It's good enough, for I made it myself. I can't, said Tom, and he laid his head on his knees, and then asked, Is it Sunday? No, then, why should it be? Because I hear the church bells ringing so. Bless thy pretty heart, the bairn's sick. Come with me, and I'll hap thee up somewhere. If thou wert a bit cleaner, I'd put thee in my own bed for the Lord's sake. But come along here." But when Tom tried to get up, he was so tired and giddy that she had to help him and lead him. She put him in an outhouse, upon soft sweet hay and an old rug, and bade him sleep off his walk, and she would come to him when school was over, in an hour's time. 
and so she went in again, expecting Tom to fall fast asleep at once. But Tom did not fall asleep. Instead of it, he turned and tossed and kicked about in the strangest way, and felt so hot all over that he longed to get into the river and cool himself. And then he fell half asleep, and dreamt that he heard the little white lady crying to him, "'Oh, you're so dirty! Go and be washed!' and then that he heard the Irishwoman saying, "'Those that wish to be clean, clean they will be!' And then he heard the church bells ring so loud, close to him too, that he was sure it must be Sunday, in spite of what the old dame had said, and he would go to church, and see what a church was like inside, for he had never been in one, poor little fellow, in all his life. But the people would never let him come in, all over soot and dirt like that. He must go to the river, and wash first. And he said out loud again and again, though being half asleep he did not know it, I must be clean, I must be clean. And all of a sudden he found himself not in the outhouse on the hay, but in the middle of a meadow, over the road, with the stream just before him, saying continually, I must be clean, I must be clean. He had got there on his own legs between sleep and awake, as children will often get out of bed and go about the room when they are not quite well. But he was not a bit surprised, and went on to the bank of the brook, and lay down on the grass, and looked into the clear, clear limestone water, with every pebble at the bottom bright and clean, while the little silver trout dashed about in fright at the sight of his black face. And he dipped his hand in, and found it so cool, cool, cool. And he said, I will be a fish, I will swim in the water, I must be clean, I must be clean. So he pulled off all his clothes in such haste that he tore some of them, which was easy enough with such ragged old things. And he put his poor hot sore feet into the water, and then his legs, and the farther he went in, the more the church bells rang in his head. Ah, said Tom, I must be quick and wash myself. The bells are ringing quite loud now, and they will stop soon, and then the door will be shut, and I shall never be able to get in at all. Tom was mistaken, for in England the church doors are left open all service time, for everybody who likes to come in. Churchman or dissenter, ay, even if you were a Turk or a heathen, and if any man dared turn him out, as long as he behaved quietly, the good old English law would punish that man, as he deserved, for ordering any peaceable person out of God's house, which belongs to all alike. But Tom did not know that, any more than he knew a great deal more which people ought to know. And all the while he never saw the Irishwoman, not behind him this time, but before, for just before he came to the riverside, she had stepped down into the cool clear water, and her shawl and her petticoat floated off her, and the green water-weeds floated round her sides, and the white water-lilies floated round her head, and the fairies of the stream came up from the bottom and bore her away and down upon their arms, for she was the queen of them all, and perhaps of more besides. "'Where have you been?' they asked her. I have been smoothing sick folks' pillows, and whispering sweet dreams into their ears, opening cottage casements to let out the stifling air, coaxing little children away from gutters, and foul pools where fever breeds, turning women from the gin-shop door, and staying men's hands as they were going to strike their wives, doing all I can to help those who will not help themselves, and little enough that is, and weary work for me. But I have brought you a new little brother, and watched him safe all the way here." Then the fairies laughed for joy at the thought that they had a little brother coming. "'But mind, maidens, he must not see you or know that you are here. He is but a savage now, and like the beasts which perish, and from the beasts which perish he must learn. So you must not play with him, or speak to him, or let him see you, but only keep him from being harmed. Then the fairies were sad, because they could not play with their new brother, but they always did what they were told. 
and their queen floated away down the river. And whither she went, thither she came. But all this Tom, of course, never saw or heard, and perhaps if he had it would have made little difference in the story, for he was so hot and thirsty, and longed so to be clean for once, that he tumbled himself as quick as he could into the clear cool stream. And he had not been in it two minutes before he fell fast asleep, into the quietest, sunniest, coziest sleep that ever he had had in his life, and he dreamt about the green meadows by which he had walked that morning, and the tall elm-trees, and the sleeping cows, and after that he dreamt of nothing at all. The reason of his falling into such a delightful sleep is very simple, and yet hardly any one has found it out. It was merely that the fairies took him. Some people think there are no fairies. Cousin Cramchild tells little folks so in his conversations. Well, perhaps there are none in Boston, U.S., where he was raised. There are only a lot of clumsy spirits there, who can't make people hear without thumping on the table. But they get their living thereby, and I suppose that is all they want. And Aunt Agitate, in her arguments on political economy, says there are none. Well, perhaps there are none in her political economy. But it is a wide world, my little man, and thank heaven for it, for else, between crinolines and theories, some of us would get squashed. And plenty of room in it for fairies without people seeing them, unless, of course, they look in the right place. The most wonderful and the strongest things in the world, you know, are just the things which no one can see. There is life in you, and it is the life in you which makes you grow and move and think, and yet you can't see it. And there is steam in a steam engine, and that is what makes it move, and yet you can't see it. And so there may be fairies in the world, and they may be just what makes the world go round, to the old tune of C'est l'amour, l'amour, l'amour qui fait la monde ronde. And yet, no one may be able to see them, except those whose hearts are going round to that same tune. At all events, we will make believe that there are fairies in the world. It will not be the last time by many a one that we shall have to make believe. And yet, after all, there is no need for that. There must be fairies, for this is a fairy tale. And how can one have a fairy tale if there are no fairies? You don't see the logic of that. Perhaps not. Then please not to see the logic of a great many arguments exactly like it, which you will hear before your beard is grey. End of chapter 2, part 1「2, Part Two of the Water Babies by Charles Kingsley Read for LibriVox.org by Corrie Samuel The kind old dame came back at twelve, when school was over, to look at Tom, but there was no Tom there. She looked about for his footprints, but the ground was so hard that there was no slot, as they say in dear old North Devon, and if you grow up to be a brave healthy man, you may some day know what no slot means, and know too, I hope, what a slot does mean, a broad slot, with blunt claws, which makes a man put out his cigar, and set his teeth, and tighten his girths when he sees it, and what his rights mean, if he has them, brow, bay, tray, and points, and see something worth seeing between Haddon Wood and Countisbury Cliff, with good Mr. Palk Collins, to show you the way, and mend your bones as fast as you smash them. Only, when that jolly day comes, please don't break your neck. Stogged in a mire you will never be, I trust, for you are a heath-cropper, bred and born. So the old dame went in again, quite sulky, thinking that little Tom had tricked her with a false story, and shammed ill, and then run away again. But she altered her mind the next day for when Sir John and the rest of them had run themselves out of breath, and lost Tom, they went back again, looking very foolish, and they looked more foolish still, when Sir John heard more of the story from the nurse, 
and more foolish still again when they heard the whole story from Miss Ellie, the little lady in white. All she had seen was a poor little black chimney sweep crying and sobbing and going to get up the chimney again. Of course she was very much frightened, and no wonder. But that was all. The boy had taken nothing in the room. By the mark of his little sooty feet they could see that he had never been off the hearth-rug till the nurse caught hold of him. It was all a mistake. So Sir John told Grimes to go home, and promised him five shillings if he would bring the boy quietly up to him, without beating him, that he might be sure of the truth. For he took for granted, and Grimes too, that Tom had made his way home. But no Tom came back to Mr. Grimes that evening, and he went to the police office to tell them to look out for the boy, but no Tom was heard of. As for his having gone over those great fells to Vendale, they no more dreamed of that than of his having gone to the moon. So Mr. Grimes came up to Harthover next day with a very sour face, but when he got there Sir John was over the hills and far away, and Mr. Grimes had to sit in the outer servants' hall all day and drink strong ale to wash away his sorrows, and they were washed away long before Sir John came back. For good Sir John had slept very badly that night, and he said to his lady, "'My dear, the boy must have got over into the grouse moors and lost himself, and he lies very heavily on my conscience, poor little lad, but I know what I will do.' So, at five the next morning, up he got, and into his bath, and into his shooting-jacket and gaiters, and into the stable-yard, like a fine old English gentleman, with a face as red as a rose, and a hand as hard as a table, and a back as broad as a bullock's, and bade them bring his shooting-pony, and the keeper to come on his pony, and the huntsman, and the first whip, and the second whip, and the underkeeper with the bloodhound in a leash, a great dog, as tall as a calf, of the colour of a gravel-walk, with mahogany ears and nose, and a throat like a church bell. They took him up to the place where Tom had gone into the wood, and there the hound lifted up his mighty voice, and told them all he knew. Then he took them to the place where Tom had climbed the wall, and they shoved it down and all got through. And then the wise dog took them over the moor, and over the fells, step by step, very slowly, for the scent was a day old, you know, and very light from the heat and drought. But that was why cunning old Sir John started at five in the morning. And at last he came to the top of Luthwaite Crag, and there he bayed, and looked up in their faces, as much as to say, I tell you, he has gone down here. They could hardly believe that Tom would have gone so far, and when they looked to that awful cliff they could never believe that he would have dared to face it. But if the dog said so, it must be true. Heaven forgive us, said Sir John. If we find him at all we shall find him lying at the bottom." And he slapped his great hand upon his great thigh, and said, "'Who will go down over Luthwaite Crag, and see if that boy is alive? Oh, that I were twenty years younger, and I would go down myself!' And so he would have done, as well as any sweep in the county. Then he said, "'Twenty pounds to the man who brings me that boy alive!' And, as was his way, what he said, he meant. Now, among the lot was a little groom-boy, a very little groom indeed, and he was the same who had ridden up the court and told Tom to come to the hall, and he said, Twenty pounds or none, I will go down Luthwaite Crag, if it's only for the poor boy's sake, for he was as civil a spoken little chap as ever climbed a flue. So down over Luthwaite Crag he went. A very smart groom he was at the top, and a very shabby one at the bottom, for he tore his gaiters, and he tore his breeches, and he tore his jacket, and he burst his braces, and he burst his boots, and he lost his hat, and what was worst of all, he lost his shirt-pin, which he prized very much, for it was gold, and he had won it in a raffle at Moulton, and there was a figure at the top of it, of told mare, noble old beeswing herself as natural as life. So it was a really severe loss, but he never saw anything of Tom. And all the while Sir John and the rest were riding round, 
full three miles to the right and back again, to get into Vendale and to the foot of the crag. When they came to the old dame's school, all the children came out to see. And the old dame came out too, and when she saw Sir John she curtsied very low, for she was a tenant of his. "'Well, dame, and how are you?' said Sir John. "'Blessings on you as broad as your back, Hearthover,' says she. She didn't call him Sir John, but only Hearthover, for that is the fashion in the North Country. "'And welcome into Vendale. But you're no hunting the fox this time of the year.' "'I am hunting, and strange game too.' said he. "'Blessings on your heart, and what makes you look so sad the morn?' "'I'm looking for a lost child, a chimney-sweep, that has run away.' "'Oh, hearth over, hearth over,' says she. "'Ye were always a just man, and a merciful, and ye'll no harm the poor little lad if I give you tidings of him.' "'Not I, not I, dame. I'm afraid we hunted him out of the house all on a miserable mistake, and the hound has brought him to the top of Luthwaite Crag, and—' Whereat the old dame broke out crying, without letting him finish his story. "'So he told me the truth after all, poor little dear. Ah, first thoughts are best, and a body's heart'll guide them right if they will but hearken to it.' And then she told Sir John all. "'Bring the dog here and lay him on,' said Sir John, without another word and he set his teeth very hard. And the dog opened at once, and went away at the back of the cottage, over the road and over the meadow, and through a bit of alder copse, and there, upon an alder stump, they saw Tom's clothes lying. And then they knew as much about it all as there was any need to know. And Tom? Ah! Now comes the most wonderful part of this wonderful story. Tom, when he woke, for of course he woke, children always wake after they have slept exactly as long as is good for them, found himself swimming about in the stream, being about four inches, or, that I may be accurate, 3.87902 inches long, and having round the parotid region of his fauces a set of external gills, I hope you understand all the big words, just like those of a sucking eft, which he mistook for a lace frill, till he pulled at them, found he hurt himself, and made up his mind that they were part of himself, and best left alone. In fact, the fairies had turned him into a water-baby. A water-baby? You never heard of a water-baby? Perhaps not. That is the very reason why this story was written. There are a great many things in the world which you never heard of, and a great many more which nobody ever heard of, and a great many things, too, which nobody will ever hear of, at least until the coming of the Coxigrues, when man shall be the measure of all things. But there are no things as water babies. How do you know that? Have you been there to see? And if you had been there to see, and had seen none, that would not prove that there were none. If Mr. Garth does not find a fox in Eversley Wood, as folks sometimes fear he never will, that does not prove that there are no such things as foxes. And, as is Eversley Wood to all the woods in England, so are the waters we know to all the waters in the world. And no one has a right to say that no water babies exist, till they have seen no water babies existing, which is quite a different thing, mind, from not seeing water babies, and a thing which nobody ever did, or perhaps ever will do. But surely if there were water babies, somebody would have caught one at least. Well, how do you know that somebody has not? But they would have put it into spirits, or into the illustrated news, or perhaps cut it into two halves, poor dear little thing, and sent one to Professor Owen and one to Professor Huxley to see what they would each say about it. Ah, my dear little man, that does not follow at all, as you will see before the end of the story. But a water baby is contrary to nature. Well, but my dear little man, you must learn to talk about such things, when you grow older, in a very different way from that. 
you must not talk about ain't and can't when you speak of this great wonderful world round you of which the wisest man knows only the very smallest corner and is as the great sir isaac newton said only a child picking up pebbles on the shore of a boundless ocean you must not say that this cannot be or that that is contrary to nature you do not know what nature is or what she can do and nobody knows not even sir roderick murchison or professor owen or professor sedgwick or professor huxley or mr darwin or professor faraday or mr grove or any other of the great men whom good boys are taught to respect they are very wise men and you must listen respectfully to all they say but even if they should say which i am sure they never would that cannot exist that is contrary to nature you must wait a little and see for perhaps even they may be wrong it is only children who read aunt agitates arguments or cousin cramchild's conversations or lads who go to popular lectures and see a man pointing at a few big ugly pictures on the wall or making nasty smells with bottles and squirts for an hour or two and calling that anatomy or chemistry who talk about cannot exist and contrary to nature wise men are afraid to say that there is anything contrary to nature except what is contrary to mathematical truth for two and two cannot make five and two straight lines cannot join twice and a part cannot be as great as the whole and so on at least so it seems at present but the wiser men are the less they talk about cannot that is a very rash dangerous word that cannot and if people use it too often the queen of all the fairies who makes the clouds thunder and the fleas bite and takes just as much trouble about one as about the other is apt to astonish them suddenly by showing them that although they say she cannot yet she can and what is more will whether they approve or not and therefore it is that there are dozens and hundreds of things in the world which we should certainly have said were contrary to nature if we did not see them going on under our eyes all day long if people had never seen little seeds grow into great plants and trees of quite different shape from themselves and these trees again produce fresh seeds to grow into fresh trees they would have said the thing cannot be it is contrary to nature and they would have been quite as right in saying so as in saying that most other things cannot be or suppose again that you had come like monsieur de chelieu a traveller from unknown parts and that no human being had ever seen or heard of an elephant and suppose that you described him to people and said this is the shape and the plan and anatomy of the beast and of his feet and of his trunk and of his grinders and of his tusks though they are not tusks at all but two foreteeth run mad and this is a section of his skull more like a mushroom than a reasonable skull of a reasonable or unreasonable beast and so forth and so forth and though the beast which i assure you i have seen and shot is first cousin to the little hairy coney of scripture second cousin to a pig and i suspect thirteenth or fourteenth cousin to a rabbit yet he is the wisest of all beasts and can do everything save read write and cast accounts people would surely have said nonsense your elephant is contrary to nature and have thought you were telling stories as the french thought of le Vaillant, when he came back to paris and said that he had shot a giraffe and as the king of the cannibal islands thought of the english sailor when he said that in his country water turned to marble and rain fell as feathers they would tell you the more they knew of science your elephant is an impossible monster contrary to the laws of comparative anatomy as far as is yet known to which you would answer the less the more you thought did not learned men too hold till within the last twenty-five years that a flying dragon was an impossible monster and do we not now know that there are hundreds of them found fossil up and down the world people call them pterodactyls 
but that is only because they are ashamed to call them flying dragons, after denying so long that flying dragons could exist. The truth is that folks fancy that such and such things cannot be, simply because they have not seen them, is worth no more than a savage's fancy that there cannot be such a thing as a locomotive, because he never saw one running wild in the forest. Wise men know that their business is to examine what is, and not to settle what is not. They know that there are elephants, they know that there have been flying dragons, and the wiser they are, the less inclined they will be to say positively that there are no water babies. No water babies, indeed! Why, wise men of old said everything on earth had its double in the water, and you may see that that is, if not quite true, still quite as true as most other theories, which you are likely to hear for many a day. There are land babies, then why not water babies? Are there not water rats, water flies, water crickets, water crabs, water tortoises, water scorpions, water tigers, and water hogs, water cats and water dogs, sea lions and sea bears, sea horses and sea elephants, sea mice and sea urchins, sea razors and sea pens, sea combs and sea fans, and of plants, are there not water grass and water crowfoot, water milfoil, and so on without end? But all these things are only nicknames. The water things are not really akin to the land things. That's not always true. They are, in millions of cases, not only of the same family, but actually the same individual creatures. Do not even you know that a green drake, and an alder fly, and a dragonfly, live under water till they change their skins, just as Tom changed his? And if a water animal can continually change into a land animal, why should not a land animal sometimes change into a water animal? Don't be put down by any of Cousin Cramchild's arguments, but stand up to him like a man, and answer him, quite respectfully, of course, thus. If Cousin Cramchild says that if there are water babies they must grow into water men, ask him how he knows that they do not, and then how he knows that they must, any more than the Proteus of the Adelsberg caverns grows into a perfect newt. If he says that it is too strange a transformation for a land baby to turn into a water baby, ask him if he ever heard of the transformation of Silis, or the Distomas, or the common jellyfish, of which M. Cortrefage says excellently well. Who would not exclaim that a miracle had come to pass if he saw a reptile come out of the egg dropped by the hen in his poultry yard, and the reptile give birth at once to an indefinite number of fishes and birds? Yet the history of the jellyfish is quite as wonderful as that would be. Ask him if he knows about all this, and if he does not, tell him to go and look for himself, and advise him, very respectfully, of course, to settle no more what strange things cannot happen, till he has seen what strange things do happen every day. If he says that things cannot degrade, that is, change downwards into lower forms, ask him, who told him that water babies were lower than land babies? But even if they were, does he know about the strange degradation of the common goose barnacles, which one finds sticking on ships' bottoms, or the still stranger degradation of some cousins of theirs, of which one hardly likes to talk, so shocking and ugly it is? And lastly, if he says, as he most certainly will, that these transformations only take place in the lower animals, and not in the higher. Say that that seems to little boys, and to some grown people, a very strange fancy. For if the changes of the lower animals are so wonderful, and so difficult to discover, why should there not be changes in the higher animals, far more wonderful, and far more difficult to discover? And may not man, the crown and flower of all things, undergo some change, as much more wonderful than all the rest, as the great exhibition is more wonderful than a rabbit-burrow. Let him answer that. And if he says, as he will, that not having seen such a change in his experience, he is not bound to believe it, ask him, respectfully, where his microscope has been. 
does not each of us, in coming into this world, go through a transformation just as wonderful as that of a sea-egg or a butterfly, and does not reason and analogy, as well as scripture, tell us that that transformation is not the last, and that, though what we shall be we know not, yet we are here but as the crawling caterpillar, and shall be hereafter as the perfect fly. The old Greeks, heathens as they were, saw as much as that two thousand years ago, and I care very little for Cousin Cramchild, if he sees even less than they. And so forth, and so forth, till he is quite cross. And then tell him that if there are no water babies, at least there ought to be, and that, at least, he cannot answer. And meanwhile, my dear little man, till you know a great deal more about nature than Professor Owen and Professor Huxley put together, don't tell me about what cannot be, or fancy that anything is too wonderful to be true. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, said old David, and so we are, and so is everything around us, down to the very deal table. Yes, much more fearfully and wonderfully made already is the table, as it stands now, nothing but a piece of dead deal wood, than if, as foxes say, and geese believe, spirits could make it dance, or talk to you by rapping on it. Am I in earnest? Oh, dear, no! Don't you know that this is a fairy tale, and all fun and pretense, and that you are not to believe one word of it, even if it is true? But at all events, so it happened to Tom. And therefore the keeper, and the groom, and Sir John, made a great mistake, and were very unhappy, Sir John at least, without any reason, when they found a black thing in the water, and said it was Tom's body, and that he had been drowned. They were utterly mistaken. Tom was quite alive, and cleaner and merrier than he had ever been. The fairies had washed him, you see, in the swift river, so thoroughly, that not only his dirt, but his whole husk and shell had been washed quite off him, and the pretty little real Tom was washed out of the inside of it, and swam away, as a caddis does when its case of stones and silk is bored through, and away it goes on its back, paddling to the shore, there to split its skin and fly away as a caperer, on four fawn-coloured wings, with long legs and horns. They are foolish fellows, the caperers, and fly into the candle at night if you leave the door open. We will hope Tom will be wiser, now he has got safe out of his sooty old shell. But good Sir John did not understand all this, not being a fellow of the Linnaean society, and he took it into his head that Tom was drowned. When they looked into the empty pockets of his shell, and found no jewels there, nor money, nothing but three marbles and a brass button with a string to it. Then Sir John did something as like crying as ever he did in his life, and blamed himself more bitterly than he need have done. So he cried, and the groom-boy cried, and the huntsman cried, and the dame cried, and the little girl cried, and the dairy-maid cried, and the old nurse cried, for it was somewhat her fault, and my lady cried, for though people have wigs, that is no reason why they should not have hearts. But the keeper did not cry, though he had been so good-natured to Tom the morning before, for he was so dried up with running after poachers, that you could no more get tears out of him than milk out of leather. And Grimes did not cry, for Sir John gave him ten pounds, and he drank it all in a week. Sir John sent, far and wide, to find Tom's father and mother, but he might have looked till doomsday for them for one was dead, and the other was in Botany Bay. And the little girl would not play with her dolls for a whole week, and never forgot poor little Tom. And soon my lady put a pretty little tombstone over Tom's shell in the little churchyard in Vendale, where the old dalesmen all sleep side by side, between the limestone crags. And the dame decked it with garlands every Sunday, till she grew so old that she could not stir abroad then the little children decked it for her. And always she sang an old, old song, as she sat spinning what she called her wedding dress. The children could not understand it, 
but they liked it none the less for that, for it was very sweet and very sad, and that was enough for them. And these are the words of it. When all the world is young, lad, and all the trees are green, and every goose a swan, lad, and every lass a queen, then hey for boot and horse, lad, and round the world away, young blood must have its course, lad, and every dog his day. When all the world is old, lad, and all the trees are brown, and all the sport is stale, lad, and all the wheels run down, creep home and take your place there, the spent and maimed among. God grant you find one face there, you loved when all was young. Those are the words, but they are only the body of it. The soul of the song was the dear old woman's sweet face and sweet voice, and the sweet old air to which she sang, and that, alas, one cannot put on paper. And at last she grew so stiff and lame that the angels were forced to carry her, and they helped her on with her wedding dress, and carried her up over half over fells, and a long way beyond that too. And there was a new schoolmistress in Vendale, and we will hope that she was not certificated. And all the while Tom was swimming about in the river, with a pretty little lace collar of gills about his neck, as lively as a grig, and as clean as a fresh-run salmon. Now, if you don't like my story, then go to the schoolroom and learn your multiplication table, and see if you like that better. Some people, no doubt, would do so. So much the better for us, if not for them. It takes all sorts, they say, to make a world. End of chapter 2, part 2. This recording is in the public domain.